to the first uh, Newton in a Circular Economy uh, Summit for 2022. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation upon whose uh, ancestors land this UTS stands, and I would like to play, uh, pay respect to the elders both past and present, uh, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of the knowledge of this land. So my name is Shera Punto, and I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UTS, and I'm also one of the CIs. So I'm moderating this session, and in the second session, uh, Dr. Leonard Tejing will be uh, uh, moderating that. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, all the lead CIs for sending your bio and the abstract uh, within the short notice. And uh, actually, uh, we as we will be having this summit in a more formal and a more organized way in the future. So we thought that this way we, it's better to start in a mid, bit in a more formal way, and that in the future we can potentially expand this summit to a larger audience, and then so that we can reach our uh, the activities of the summit to, to the wider audience. So we are supposed to have eight speakers today, but uh, uh, Dr. Liu Yi from Queensland University, uh, University of Queensland had to uh, withdraw at the last minute because of some medical emergency with her son. So, uh, so <clears throat> we'll have eight uh, speakers today, so we have some time for a time buffer. Uh, as a just a housekeeping, so we have uh, each speaker is allowed 15 minutes, allocated 15 minutes to for, for their presentation, then would uh, ideally, uh, uh, if you can uh, present for uh, 10 minutes and then uh, keep aside five minutes for question and answer session. So after 10 minutes, I'll give you just a, a, a reminder and then yeah, we can wrap up for more question and answer session. But of course we have, as I said, some buffer time. Uh, after the first speaker, uh, from, uh, after Sean's spe uh, presentation, that we will have some photo session. Maybe if everyone can uh, later on uh, put on your camera, and then we can just want to screenshot and then as a record for our uh, uh, the first summit. Uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to welcome now Professor Sean, who is the ERC Hub Director, and uh, so that he will update the progress and also welcome all the participants. I thank you very much and please enjoy the session today. Thank you. Sean? Yeah. Try to share the, my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. This is nice. ah, that's great. So I'd like to begin acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I stand and pay my respect to elders, past, uh, present, and emerging. Hello, everybody. My name is Ho Kyung Shun, the director of the uh, Nutrient in a Circular Economy. Uh, this is uh, our privilege to organize the first uh, Nutrient in a Circular Economy Summit, so, which is called First uh, Nice Summit. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, the organizer, Dr. Sharu Punchu, and then Leonard Tijing, also Ibram S. Salebi, and then uh, Stefano Friguela. So they have been involved in uh, this uh, organization for the Nice Hub for the last uh, uh, six months. So we have uh, a weekly meeting to reach the, this level. So very happy to share for the good news of the, our AIC Hub. So we are very much uh, ready to start so that uh, I want to update the, what's the progress of the AIC Hub and then what will happen for the next couple of months and years also. Today meeting is the most important. It's uh, what we want to uh, know, get, we, we want to get to know each other because even though we are working together in AIC Nice Hub, but I'm sure that uh, not many people know each other. Also, they don't know who is doing what kind of research, how we can collaborate. So make sure this uh, first summit is about to discuss about research 
not too many administrative related questions. If you need any administrative, uh, for example, like a tax invoice or some of the Annex C, so you can just send the email. We are happy to follow up. Also, we will keep you updated how you can progress the uh, administrative of the, this project. But this time, uh, this uh, next three hours, we will focus on who is doing the what kind of research and the, how we can collaborate in the future and the, how we can work together. So if you can focus on this kind of uh, research item, that would be very much appreciated. So this is the outline of the today the summit, the progress of the AIC hub. So who are the our final partner organizations? And then I will uh, brief the what kind of the research we are planning to do as a linear and circular economy, also contribution to the sustainable development goal. So what research activities we are planning to do in this program? So what's the next step we have to follow? In 2019, so I met uh, Stefano from the University of Melbourne. Uh, we attended a conference and then we discussed about the AIC Nice Hub, how we can create the, this kind of opportunity. And then 2020, so we had a weekly, almost a monthly meeting to organize the, some of the industry partners. And then we push uh, very hard to make uh, this kind of happen. And then we submitted our AIC hub application November, 2020. Although as you know, the, we had a very serious pandemic, but uh, yeah, luckily we got a strong support from the industry partners. And then we submit our application November, 2020. And we got a very good outcome, July 2021, last year. And since then, so we have had a lot of uh, uh, follow-up. Initially, the, because of this pandemic, the international partner organization withdrew because of the uncertainty of the international collaboration. So we lost uh, three international uh, industry partners. So we tried to look at the, some of the alternative local industry partners. And then luckily, yeah, we tried to uh, satisfy our threshold of the cash contribution from the industry partners. And what happened is that early this year, so we got another problem because of the inflation as well as the, some of the economic recession. So small businesses, they all withdraw this project because of the not has a cash flow. Also, we had a problem of the construction company. So we used to have a several construction industry partners. And then because of the, this uh, pandemic, they had a little bit of problem for the construction economic uh, situation. That's why reason. So we lost uh, three construction company, but luckily, we got a lot of strong support from the water utility as well as some of the water technology company. So we are very happy to uh, satisfy the, all the cash contribution from the, our minimum threshold and then ready to go our project. So we have uh, generated a website, also social media, also some industry partner. We have uh, changed a lot. And I will introduce the, who are the new industry partners and then new universities. Also hub agreement completed. And then project agreement is still going on. So after this uh, meeting, so we can finalize the, our project agreement, which is the Annex C. So you can complete this one and then we can start your activity. So officially we will start our hub on 31st of July this month. So just a few weeks later, we will start officially our project. Also official lunch will be held on 17 November, 2022. So we have uh, 
uh, World Toilet Day, 19th of November. That's the reason why we set the, this day, 17th of November, as the official launch of the project. So we are planning to invite the Minister of uh, Education, who is the Jason Clare, also the ARC CEO, Judy, and then Executive Director of the ARC, also UTS, uh, DBCI, Vice Chancellor, and Dean, and then our head of school. So if uh, you want to invite any important people from industry partners, so please let us know. We are just uh, uh, at the planning stage for this official lunch. This will take uh, only one hour, so we will have official lunch. At the same time, we are planning to organize the second AIC Nights of Summer. So in the morning, we can have uh, just one session, and then we will have official lunch for one hour, and then we can have a, a lunch together with the, all the um, people. And the afternoon session, we will also invite some of the industry partner or the CI to make them their own research progress and then presentation. So we will organize second AIC Hub Summit in 17 November, 2022. So if you have any suggestion for this official lunch, so please let us know. We can make a very memorable uh, launch of the, our AIC Hub. So this is the logo we have uh, uh, for this AIC Hub from the uh, Aboriginal uh, artist. So this is the, our logo, so you can just utilize it for your website. Also, when you have uh, some communication of the AIC Nice Hub, so you can uh, utilize the, this logo. Also, several PhD students uh, we have in this uh, um, summit. Also, we are working with the project together with them. So now is the time to you can recruit your own PhD student or research assistant, research associate. So we can progress the, our project for the next four years. Also publishing some journal article. So whenever you publish some paper, yes, yeah, just uh, let us know. So we can promote in our communication channels using social media and website. Also, we are now recruiting the scientific and industry advisory committee members. So if you have anybody who would be very suitable, so please let us know. We will finalize the, all the uh, this governance uh, committee members. Also, her manager, uh, Leonard, Teaching, and Ibram, they are helping this uh, co coordinate uh, role, but uh, uh, next couple of weeks. So we will have uh, official hub manager who will take care of uh, general administrative and then business as well as the, some commercialization opportunities. So if you know any suitable hub manager, so we are ready to promote the, this uh, position through the job seeker. So please uh, let them apply and then we will select the hub manager uh, next couple of weeks. So this is the, our partner organization. So we have uh, seven universities, UTS, University of Melbourne, and Griffiths University, uh, Western Sydney University, and Southern Queensland uh, uh, University, University of Southern Queensland and Victoria University and the University of Queensland. Also, we have uh, 23 partner organizations. So some of them are existing one, and then some of them are new uh, partner organization. Urban Utilities, City of Sydney, Siontech, Southeast Water, Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer, Pyrocol, Origin Water, Melbourne Water, EIC Activities, ISOM, AJJ Technology, Durax Group, and Parkway Process Solution, Queensland Water Directorate, and City of the Logan, and I Icon Water, the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney, NutriTech Solution, Hess Land and Water, Hydrogen 2.0, South Bank uh, Parklands, 
and Department of the Environmental and Science, Queensland has. So they are all very much strongly supportive for this project to make this happen. Also, we have uh, three international organizations, IWAG from Switzerland, UNIST, USA National Institute of Science Technology in Korea, and the Rich Arts Institute in the US. So they are also supporting the our technical as well as the industrial uh, oriented commercial opportunities. So please feel free to contact them because they are our team members. So we will continue to work with them for next uh, uh, couple of years. So attracting the industry partner uh, is very difficult, but uh, maintaining to satisfying and the working together with uh, this industry partners are uh, much more difficult. So we need a very much active role from the each university CI to engage with the industry partner to work with them and that to make sure that the, how they uh, satisfy the, our project progress and their benefit. So please let us know if you need any support. We have a hub manager as well as the, uh, some kind of funding to support their demand. So we will keep discussing to help each other for the this uh, industry partners. So this is the our general concept of the AIC Nice Hub. So we live in the linear circular economy system. So we have a, a nitrogen fixation using the Haber-Bosch process. So this is the very energy intensive. So you need 100 bar pressure and then 1000 your high temperature. So world energy consumption require almost 2% of the, this kind of for production of the fertilizer. Also, phosphorus is a limited reserve. So we need to find the alternative for the future. So we look at the, this nitrogen and phosphorus and produce the food. And then we consume the, this food and produce the CO2 N2, which is the greenhouse gas emission material. And then also we produce the nitrogen phosphorus in the environment. And we have to also reduce the, our nitrogen phosphorus. So if we make sure this kind of circular econ linear economy to circular economy system, so we can make a lot of benefit in terms of the economy as well as environment. So we try to achieve the, uh, this nitrogen phosphorus how to make a fertilizer produce the food and then we can consume. So this is the way we want to propose the, our uh, ASC hub for the overall circular economy system in terms of uh, nutrient. If we achieve this one, uh, we can contribute to significantly uh, sustainable development goal. So you can see the um, sustainable cities and communities. And number 13, climate actions. We can contribute also life below water because of the nitrogen, phosphorus, algae will grow and then the ecosystem of the water below will have a damage so that we can protect our environment. Also responsible consumption and production can be achieved and the clean water sanitation, good health and well-being can be achieved from the, our circular economy in nutrient. Also zero hunger can be contributed for our concept. So that's the, what we are trying to achieve for the SDG from the United Nations proposed. So this is the AIC Nice Hub, how we can achieve these goals. So you can see the household wastewater, we produce the urine and a lot of uh, black wastewater, gray wastewater. And this one is the industry wastewater, a lot of uh, nutrient rich wastewater. Also livestock wastewater, so pig and cow 
they produce a lot of uh, nitrogen phosphorus wastewater. So we treat the, this kind of nitrogen phosphorus and we can also produce the sum of the nutrient from the, our wastewater. So nice hub can contribute to convert the, our wastewater nutrient to fertilizer system. Also after wastewater treatment plant, so we have a uh, food waste as well as the sludge. So anaerobic digester can produce a lot of uh, biogas as well as the, some of the uh, biosolid, biochar and the composting. So supernatant also contain very high concentration of nitrogen and phosphorus. So we can convert this kind of uh, nutrient source from household, industrial, livestock, as well as anaerobic digester. So we can convert this uh, nutrient as a fertilizer to grow the some uh, edible crops, also non uh, edible crops. So we can make uh, some green wall or tough glass as well as the uh, city parks. So we can contribute our fertilizer, also make sure that the, our clean environment. So that's the overall, our objective of the AIC NICE Hub to extract uh, nutrient as much as possible from different water sources. And this is the, what we can achieve from the specific, our nutrient recovery system. So urine, we targeting on urine because the urine has a very uh, high concentration of nutrient. Also relatively easy to collect compared to the industrial wastewater or livestock wastewater. So we can utilize the, this urine as a one of template from the, this uh, nutrient recovery system. So how to effectively collect urine, how to effectively we can processing to convert urine to fertilizer, how to optimize the, this fertilizer and how to apply this uh, fertilizer system. So that's the, what we try to achieve from the, our eight, seven university CIs and then 23 industry partners and then three international collaborators. So they have their own uh, expertise to make sure that the, our own the, uh, expertise as well as the economics, how we can make sure this economy with the stakeholders, also engagement, learning and communications are our objectives. So stakeholder engagement are very important. So we will make sure social technical issue from the different uh, universities. So this is the uh, University of Technology Sydney have developed uh, this uh, membrane bioreactor system to convert the, our urine to fertilizer. So our university has a 15 story and then we have a urine separation uh, toilet and then we collect the urine at the basement. And then we have uh, produced every day around one, 2000 liter of the uh, urine. And then we process the biological treatment process to remove the smell and then some of the ammonia to convert to nitrate. And then we distillate and produce the very concentrated urine fertilizer, which called uh, over. So you are valuable and urine is valuable. So we tested some of the hydroponic system together with the Royal Botanic Garden. And then we found out the very uh, similar performance of the commercially available fertilizer. So that's the, our current uh, technology we have developed. So we are collaborating with the Royal Botanic Garden EIC activities. So they are trying to collect some of the precipitants, struvite and calcium phosphate to make a bio -blick for the construction application, direct group. They are the fertilizer company to try to make a more optimized uh, fertilizer solution, origin water, the membrane technology, also office of the chief scientist, engineer. In general, they are supporting the circular economy in New South Wales. City of Sydney, they are happy to uh, purchase the, our fertilizer to apply to the, their parkland. Also, Sion Tech, 
they are some of the membrane technology we are trying to uh, collaborate. Also Southeast water, they are very much interested in the downstream of the wastewater treatment impact. So we collect the urine at the upstream. So we have a reduced uh, ca carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus concentration in a wastewater treatment plant. So Southeast water, they are very much interested in how this will impact overall saving of the nitrification process in a wastewater treatment plant, as well as the environmental discharge of the their effluent for the nitrogen and phosphorus, and then how this will impact also overall CO2 and N2 greenhouse gas emission. So we are collaborating with Southeast Water, and they are also interested in the technology overall. So even though the Sydney node, we are targeting on the biological treatment process, the Brisbane node, so urban utility and Stefano, they we are very much focused on the electrochemical process. So the Southeast water, they also wanna develop a very simple and low cost the fertilizer production technology. So that's the, we are collaborating with the Southeast water. Rich Earth Institute and UNIST, Iwak, Western Sydney University. We are also providing this fertilizer to look at the soil behavior, also fertilizer uh, performance, also hydrogen 2.0. So from the our urine, so we produce a lot of ammonia. Ammonia can make a hydrogen source. So how we can combine this ammonia to hydrogen production. So we have a uh, collaboration with the hydrogen 2.0. So that's the what we are planning to uh, collaborate for next uh, couple of years to look at the overall uh, technology side and the production as well as the fertilizer application. Also ISA people, Dana and Jason, will talk about the socio-technical issue for their presentation in the second session. So I will not discuss about the ISF people uh, economics as well as the engagement issue in this program, but they will work together with the Sydney Node to develop the overall holistic the approach of the, this uh, technology. So that's the what we are planning to do in Sydney Node. And what's the next? So still some of the industry partner as well as the your university CI needed to complete the project agreement, Annex C. So based on the today summit, I'm sure that you will have a better direction, better idea how you can design your Annex C together with the, your industry partner, how you can allocate budget. So you can have a finalization of the, your Annex C. Also start projects at the first, so PhD student, research associate, also very important to deliver the, our project. So please recruit your uh, PhD student, also research associate to progress the, your project faster. Also regular meetings with the, your industry partners and the launch of the AIC hub, 17th of November, Thursday. Yeah. So please, uh, if you have uh, any uh, suggestions, so please let us know. Also, we will keep following up the, your progress. So this is the KPI. So every year we will request some of the basic information from the, your organization. So how much budget you spend, also number of the mentoring program, number of uh, postdoc, PhD student in your partner organization, also number of the HDR student, how they are collaborating together with the industry partners. Also joint publication, also visit to the, some of the investment of the hub, also government, industry, business community briefings, also number of talks given by the hub investment, which are open to the public, also research output, also, you can have a nature of the commercialization commentary about uh, this hub investment achievement and uh, additional funding. So this project is just uh, us, our seeding fund. So you will have an uh, opportunity to engage the some more industry partner 
and you can have a further funding for your uh, scale up the, your research as well as the uh, research translation opportunities. I'd like to thank you again for the university CIs. So they have strong support for make happen this uh, project. Also industry partners and then AIC Hub. So they are the seven university we will work together for next to four years. So please uh, feel free to contact. Also they have their own industry partner. So you can also engage with them and then make uh, this uh, project very successful. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. So I think uh, we, uh, we are out of time now. Probably we can leave for question and answer in the discussion time. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay, Sean. Thanks. Uh, so we have, uh, I want to invite next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Stefano Frigwe from the University of Melbourne. Please, Stefano, yes. Thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> I will share my presentation. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, this is in oh. the, is it your... Can you change your display setting, Stefano, to make it a full view? Uh, I just did. I think you are showing this other screen. This is oh. the, yeah, your uh, presenter's mode. Good thing we got five minutes extra. Okay, try again. Any better? Uh, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah, it shows that your presentation, the presenter's view, not the other first in view. Maybe can you try to go to the top to the display settings? Try to just uh, put the drop down upper left. Uh, uh, our left side, left side. Display mm -hmm. settings. On the computer? Yes. I usually work this way. And do you have two screens? Or? Yeah, I got two screens on. So I think you have to. Or maybe I just remove one yeah. screen. Yeah, you have to share the right screen, otherwise, it goes to the other screen. Oh, I didn't share the screen, I shared the presentation. Maybe I can try to share the screen. Yeah, you share the screen, yeah. Okay, let's see. This way. Uh, still the same. Okay, so I'll just unplug. We could see it clearly enough. We could see it clearly enough, Stefano. I think it was okay to... Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Does it work? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. I haven't switched it on for too long. <laughs> okay, so uh, nice to see you everyone. Uh, most of the people here already know me. Uh, for those who don't know me or 
for those who have forgotten, uh, <laughs> Freguia, I'm at uh, Department of Chemical Engineering at the uh, University of Melbourne, uh, where I've been for the last two years. Before that, I was at UQ for about 10 years. So here, do you actually see Cara in the corner or is it just me? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so the that image in the, um, the bottom right corner is uh, Fisherman's Bend campus at uh, Melbourne. So this would be Melbourne's Melbourne University's new campus to be delivered approximately in five or six years time. So this will be the target of uh, a potential future trial of uh, urine diversion with uh, the technologies that we are de currently developing through NICE. Um, we would have liked to have that as part of NICE, but uh, the timing is not perfect. But certainly there would be follow-ups beyond NICE and, and this would be the target side for implementation of a larger scale trial, perhaps. So I will be talking about the uh, University of Melbourne projects within NICE, what uh, we are planning to do. Uh, before that, I'd like to move back to an introductory note. Oh, there you go. Um, so this image was already shown, uh, was already shown by Sean. Uh, and, and this was really uh, keeping us very busy a couple of years ago while we were planning the planning phase for the hub. So when I met Sean for the first time at the conference dinner in December 2019, and we started discussing about our respective research, uh, the focus quickly shifted towards urine, which was really uh, high in our rank of topics of interest. And, and we started to talk about our technologies and what needs to be done to improve it. And then uh, soon enough, we realized that uh, we were really almost entirely focused on, on this bit, so urine processing. And as engineers, that's what we do, but we, came to the realization that uh, if we are going to implement this concept of harvesting nutrients from urine, technology is not going to be the limiting step. Although there's still a lot of questions to be answered, a lot of development to be made, uh, we realize that we can't achieve implementation unless we address all these other aspects. And so we mapped it out and realized that urine collection, as well as making optimized and uh, uh, commercializable fertilizers, and fertilizers that uh, are uh, usable and effective on target uh, plants and crops. So without these elements, we, we will not be able to implement. And, and, and this is where we started to map out um, the work of NICE. Together with this outer ring, which uh, includes the very important whole of systems economics. This is something that industry partners asked us from the very start, how much is it gonna cost? Is it gonna make economic sense? And particularly for this topic, uh, acquiring, uh, not only regulatory approvals, which are essential, but also the uh, social license uh, is, is highly important. And so we realized our expertise is not enough. We, are, we should not go for another linkage project. So what we should do is to try and put together something bigger. And this is where the idea of the hub uh, was created. Obviously, urine is a big part of this hub, but this is not the only place we're gonna look for nutrients. However, the work that uh, 
we'll be doing out of Melbourne is mostly focused on urine as a source of nutrients. So I'll give you a little bit of background. So, so the technology that uh, we'll be further developing and mainstreaming perhaps as part of NICE out of Melbourne is uh, coming out of a previous ASC linkage project between uh, urban utilities and UQ, which was my previous working place. And so out of that linkage, we developed a small scale trial at uh, luggage point treatment plant, where we had a dedicated toilet block uh, with waterless urinals and a, a set of reactors that uh, we tested and optimized uh, over the duration of the project. So this was successful in attracted media attention. Urban Utilities was very happy and they were interested in, uh, in continuing, but uh, also they were concerned that another technology-oriented project was not what we needed. This is what uh, we, they also wanted, something bigger that, uh, um, that includes not only technology, but also social, economic, and uh, uh, agri aspects. And so they quickly uh, agreed onto the idea of, uh, of supporting the hub. So now what is this technology that uh, uh, we have developed through this project and why are we pursuing further development through the hub? So here we go. Got stuck. Okay, here we go. Uh, so microbial electric concentration, uh, which was uh, affectionately named uh, U-Gold, similar to Sean's technology UVAL, which identifies the value in urine. We identified the fact that uh, urine is so valuable that uh, can be considered gold. Um, so, so we won't uh, really deep dive too much, but uh, a little bit to give you background of what the technology is about. Uh, you can see here uh, what's inside one of those cells that you've seen in the picture in the previous slide. So this is uh, an electrochemical cell with an anode on the left and a cathode on the right. So this is like the same effectively as the battery or a fuel cell. Uh, it's really a fuel cell rather than a battery where we uh, feed urine as a fuel and, uh, and we use oxygen to liberate the energy of that fuel. So urine is a fuel because it contains a lot of organic matter, 10 grams per liter uh, of organic matter, which is uh, most of which is readily biodegradable. When we collect fresh urine, uh, there's most of the nitrogen is in the form of urea and, uh, and the organic matter is complex. After a period of time, which if you just let it happen naturally, it might take up to a month, but really after uh, you do it in a um, technologically advanced system, it might take only a few hours or less. The process of uh, hydrolysis leads to uh, quite a few transformations. They happen best in the presence of oxygen, particularly ure urea hydrolysis to ammonia. And uh, with that, the pH goes up to nine and, and a lot of the calcium and magnesium salts, including struvite, precipitate out. And, uh, and we can just already harvest those immediately. Uh, that's quite a bit uh, of the phosphorus already, by the way. Uh, but then the nitrogen is really staying in the liquid uh, phase. So this technology is really targeting the nitrogen primarily. So, so through the movement of electrodes through a circuit, these electrons are generated from the oxidation of chemicals in the urine. Uh, we are, are moving ions as well. So we have a cation exchange membrane and an anion exchange membrane. And similarly to what happens in electrodialysis, we're moving positive ions into a compartment in between the two electrodes and negative ions as well, moving that way from the cathode side 
to that middle compartment. So this way we are able to harvest uh, ionic species and actually the nutrients that we are targeting are all small ionic species and are selected for in this system. So the beauty of this is that uh, it requires no chemicals, no process controls as it's self-controlled and uh, in an ideal world, no power. We did demonstrate it with no power in the lab, but uh, at very low rate. So, uh, yeah. Stephen, you have five minutes more. For I mean, remaining five minutes, yeah. Okay, so let's wrap up the next uh, slide. So, so, okay, so this is really good for a decentralized process because you don't want to have uh, a lot of controls and maintenance issues. Uh, but however, we moved away from the no power because it was working too slow. We added a bit of power, we're making a bit of hydrogen at the castle. That hydrogen can actually be recovered and used to supplement some of the energy requirements, so improving the energy efficiency there. And, uh, and the rates then go up quite a bit so that uh, the system is nice and compact. What we achieved from that trial is that the urine was concentrated uh, by a factor of, uh, so the, the volume was reduced by a factor of uh, 10. Uh, concentration of key nutrients uh, was increased by a factor of uh, three to five. We have recovered up to 65% of nitrogen. There was no problems with the pathogens because of the biocidal conditions that are created in that uh, mid compartment with a lot of ammonia. Uh, good rate at uh, power consumption, which might not mean much to you, but what is important is that this is less than the combination of the energy needed to uh, denitrify, remove nitrogen in the treatment plant and the Haber-Bosch energy required to make ammonia in the first place. So we're better off than where we are at, at the moment. So that's uh, the key. The product that we made is liquid, which contain all the key nutrients uh, at the concentration, which uh, are still a bit low for liquid fertilizer markets, but they are in line with uh, the low end of what you can find in the liquid fertilizer market market, also including organic matter and a lot of trace elements. So we cheered to that and also did some uh, home-based trials because we're running out of time. We're not going to talk too much about micropollutants, but this is also another key question. What happens to the antibiotics and all the other stuff that uh, goes through our urine. The beauty here is that because of those membranes only allow small ions through, we removed 99% uh, of what we found for most of the uh, micropollutants that we were able to find in there. Only a few of them broke through and those are not the ones of main concern. Although this was just the result out of one trial and this will need to be further investigated. I'll skip on this one, otherwise we won't, I won't have time on my main slide, but basically this is just to say that uh, uh, we have a market for liquid fertilizers, it's worth quite a bit, so about half a billion dollars, which is actually one third of the total fertilizer market in Australia. It's, that's because not in terms of mass, but in terms of value, liquid fertilizers are more highly priced and they also have a lot of advantages compared to uh, solid fertilizers. With the advent of urban farming and the need of liquid fertilizers in urban parks and uh, gardens and lawns, I think what we should, we should aim for is to make the circular economy at city scale so that we are actually harvesting nutrients where the nutrients are consumed and released. So the cities are the places where we have a lot of urine, and the cities are the place where we can implement urban farming, minimizing the movement of liquid along uh, large distances. So what we're gonna do at uh, Melbourne University as part of this hub, uh, there's quite a few activities. So the main activity is this center one, uh, project UM1, uh, which will be undertaken by postdoc. 
which is field testing and mainstreaming new gold, delivering a 300 liters a day pilot at the Brisbane location. This will be an outdoors location. We still cannot disclose it, but uh, it will be a uh, location of primary visibility. Um, so, so that's uh, that basically taking what we had, improving it, and, and just uh, putting it to the test of the real world in a in a public toilet. Then uh, we don't have all the answers to technological improvements, but we will be. Um, are we out of time? It's just a couple of minutes. Um, improving rates, reducing power consumption, and increasing nutrient recovery. Because one of our partners is interested in uh, sludge digestion side stream, we'll also target that for some of the trials to see how much nutrients we can harvest in a centralized system. Uh, three PhD projects, uh, one uh, already has a name on it. Negar is actually in the meeting, uh, looking at uh, fouling management response to real world factors like uh, temperature, pH, and chemicals, and also strategies for startup and downturn, which are all real world issues that we haven't looked at in details. Uh, at the PhD project on the right, the effects <clears throat> of urine diversion on uh, sewage, sewage, treatment plant, sewage treatment plant performance. Uh, so we're gonna take urine out of the sewers. How is that gonna affect uh, sewer processes? How is that gonna affect uh, sewer treatment plants? We believe that the energy consumption will be reduced, but also what are the effects on greenhouse gas balances and uh, micropollutants? And finally, uh, the project will be based on post-processing so that whatever comes out of these uh, pilot reactors, um, can be post-processed into something that is more desirable for application in uh, agri-horticulture uh, or aqua, uh, hydroponics, or, uh, um, <clears throat> and also more concentrated to be more easily marketable. So that's uh, what we plan to do. And I believe that there's a lot of interactions possible with uh, other universities based on this. These are the partners that are you know, funding this part of the world, particularly urban utilities, uh, IXOM, Southeast Water, uh, and also our technology partner, AJJA, and Nutritrack Solution as our uh, small boutique fertilizer company. So with that, I have concluded my contribution. Thanks for thank your you. time. Thank you, thank you, Stefano. So if you have any questions, uh, can you please type it in the chat box so that I can rely on that uh, rely on the speakers? Looks like when somebody is chatting, other people are not able to view it, but I don't know what the reason. But anyway, so let's please uh, uh, put the questions in the chat box. Uh, in the interest of time, I will go to the next speaker. Uh, it's uh, Cara Bell from, uh, Professor Cara Bell from Griffith University. Uh, the floor, floor is yours, Cara. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sherrod. Good afternoon, all. Um, I will just share my screen too. Uh, it's good to meet, it's good to meet some of you. There's a few new faces uh, here, so it's good to see that I think we've got some international visitors with us as well, um, which is terrific. So just let me know if everything is tickety-boo there. All good? Oh good, yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, so I'm um, one of the, I'm the kind of the lead um, researcher at Griffith University, which is in the southeast corner of uh, Queensland in Australia. And I'll be talking to you to, today about some of the three key focus areas that myself and my colleagues, Associate so Professor Said of Takar, Professor Anne Royko, and our newly anointed PhD student, Gail Nguyen, um, will be working on. Uh, so I guess the key for this really is, is you've seen a couple of these, um, a couple of the illustrations that we, we're looking at a circular economy, you've seen lots of circles, um, we're talking about systems thinking, there's lots of different parts to this, this is such an exciting um, hub to be in because there's so many different moving parts that need to be addressed, questions that need to be answered uh, for all variety of, of 
components around um, nutrients in the circular economy. And we're looking at really the health side, the health-based risk assessments, some economic questions, and some regulatory aspects as well. Before I go much further, uh, we'll, we'll be doing our work mainly on the country of uh, Torrible and Urugal, uh, in, in Torrible and Uruga country, Yagara country. Uh, also, we have uh, lands, we'll be working on lands down in um, Yugambe as well in the Gold Coast. So I and my Griffith University colleagues pay acknowledgement to the judicial custodians of the land and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander emerging leaders and people here today. So that's just a little picky for where we are on the right there for maybe some of you international um, people who are joining us today. So the three key questions that I mentioned earlier um, for a successful, truly circular economy, for a, for a truly circular economy of anything, you need to have a truly systems thinking approach. So we're not so much focusing on the technology side. Stefano and Sean have talked very ably um, and have some good history in this, in this hub for some good technology expertise. We're hoping to kind of dovetail some of that um, with, as I said, uh, some questions around is, is urine collection and reuse, is it economically feasible? Does it stack up? Is there a business case? Will people be attracted to it? Is there some financial um, return on investment? So they're really key questions really for any of this to keep going ahead. The other key thing that I think we really we can't forget even, and, and again, Stefano mentioned it around the pharmaceuticals and, and maybe micro um, bacteriological um, elements and so on within urine and, and the fertilizer processing is, is, the, is the risks to human health. And while they may be, or previous research has shown that they're relatively low, we really need to understand that for our third question to be answered, which is those regulatory and licensing requirements, those approvals that we need from our regulators, quite understandably, in order to make sure that this is a viable, a transferable, a safe and reliable uh, process. So they're the three kind of questions that, that we're after. Yet again, you're going to see this picture a few times, um, I suspect, uh, in the next hour and a half. This is really just to, to, to situate our work um, within the whole context of the hub. So this whole of system economics, as you can see, wraps around everything, every single um, uh, uh, word or every single little act, act activity or action within that inner circle uh, will require some level of resourcing and funding and, and everyone quite rightly wants to know is there is there a, is it economically viable it's not really a lot of information readily available yet so if we want to widely adopt these urine diversion technologies we need to demonstrate not just the financial but the non-financial benefits to both the private and the public stakeholders. So that's where we'll be at. Um, and, and obviously this knowledge will help to devise appropriate strategies uh, and also promote, communicate and continue on this technological development, um, which we know is uh, obviously incredibly important, um, but we need to make sure it stacks up in a number of ways. I think we lost Cara. Yeah. She's frozen. Possibly say that you can talk about uh, her presentation slide a little bit without. Uh, well, I can I can talk about the one that's on yep. the screen yep. at the moment. Yes. Yep. So we. Yes. So hi, I'm Saeed Iftekar. I'm, um, I'm also one of the CI from Griffith University. So, uh, well, now we're not a slide, but anyway. So we are looking at, um, specifically, I'll be looking at uh, the economics aspects of it. And where GAM will be working with me on this, uh, on this aspect. So we will be looking at not only the market benefit of uh, um, nutrient derived nutrients and urine divert uh, products, but also what is the non-market or intangible and social benefits of doing this kind of sustainable practice and do, what is the benefit uh, in that sense. And then finally, we will be looking at uh, whether in the in a business case sense, does it make sense? And if uh, it does not, like what kind of regulatory and financial incentives or measures that we need to take 
to make these products or make this system more acceptable. So that's, um, Sean, that would be my take for the moment. Kara is here. I'm not sure Kara is not here yet. So probably I think maybe something might have happened. So I'm not sure. So uh, Said, is there any more that Kara has to speak or? Uh, I do sure. I'm not sure because there is another component with N, uh, which is more on the risk uh, risk side, but mm -hmm. that's I think we're still shaping up. We are still looking for a PhD student to start working on that aspect. But maybe when Kara is back, maybe we can give her a space. Maybe later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah that that I think we can we can give Kara uh, the time to speak later. So maybe I could to go to, in the interest of time, go to the next speaker, uh, Professor Michael Duke from Victoria University. Uh, yep, yeah, we're ready to go, okay. Um, I guess if uh, Cara gets back, um, I can probably uh, put her back on after my talk. All right, um, yeah. hello everybody. Um, uh, my name is Professor Michael Duke. I'm very pleased to be part of the hub and to get to meet you all. It's a very exciting opportunity because um, uh, you're all, uh, mostly new faces and, um, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you more and uh, learning about the kinds of exciting research you're doing towards um, this, uh, this uh, great ambition. Um, I'll just now, uh, okay, share my screen. Um, okay, you should see that now. How's that? Perfect. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Okay. No problem. Uh, and I do the usual trick where the um, the videos block most of the writing. Okay. Okay. So um, so yeah. I'm as I mentioned from uh, from Victoria University. I'm based in uh, Melbourne, um, and we're going to work a, a sort of uh, coming back onto a more technology focused theme, um, process development and demonstration for nutrient recovery from complex industrial solutions. <clears throat> Um, and I'm talking on behalf of, uh, I guess, our project team uh, as well. We've got a PI by Oskar Kmak, who's from Parkway Process Solutions, who was in the list that uh, Sean uh, put, uh, put up earlier. So we'll, um, uh, I can admit Kara. Yes, come up. Yes, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so this is all probably quite familiar to you, but I've got just a background slide, which uh, ex kind of provides a bit of motivation to what we're doing. But uh, resource recovery or you know, circular economy is, has been a priority goal for industry for decades to recover as much value from its process and minimize disposal. And I say that because you know the, the various projects that we've worked with over the years, um, every company that uh, we've uh, run a bench testing or pilot trial or, of, of particular technology, um, there's or done a desktop study. Uh, there's there's always uh, the need uh, to or the interest to try and make the most of whatever's purchased um, and recover it and make some value out of it. <clears throat> but how you do that um, can actually be quite complex, and the challenges are just growing more and more. And we're never surprised to find out there's more examples of where this is already happening and what we can do to learn from them. Um, is uh, is really important. For example, one that we've worked on in the past with, is with the dairy industry through projects through the ARC and Dairy Innovation Australia, which is now they've finished up. Um, but in those early uh, decades of the dairy industry, whey from cheese making was uh, simply disposed. They were put under pressure to uh, to resolve it because it was creating a health and um, environmental problems. And now the recovered whey proteins are now a major industry for them. Um, as well as the lactose. So effectively, the only thing left is the minerals um, that are, are, are a waste in a sophisticated modern dairy plant. We also see biogas, as Sean pointed out earlier. So we're already recovering that for, for value. Biosolids and wastewater already with dilute nutrients. Um, but as we keep extracting more and more from water, um, and this is the wastewater, um, particularly containing urine, um, and contaminants are a major issue. and um, the high dilution, so very working with very dilute solutions is also the issue. So it just becomes too expensive. But with the advancements of technologies with time, we can actually recover these uh, quite economically. Um, we just need to look at them again. So here's the, the 
team specific to our hub. So that's myself. Um, my background is uh, a technology background is membrane tech uh, membranes um, and we've applied these for resource recovery in the foods <coughs> foods industries uh, and for water and energy savings in the various uh, sectors of, of the industry um, and also we've got Bahe Oskrak Mac from um, Parkway Process Solutions and he's uh, um, brings in expertise of industrial technology commercialization range of applications in biotech energy and water and mining sectors so where we're sort of coming in maybe quite closely um, into this hub is um, starting from around the starting from a process that uh, Parkway has been developing called AMES. Um, and it's, a, it's called the mineral extraction system and it's an innovative process technology that enables the treatment of concentrated aqueous solutions to recover a range of valuable minerals, reagents and fresh water. But, and it has applications in desalination energy and mining and other industrial sectors. So uh, this information is available online, but uh, broadly, um, you know, you take an industrial feedstock, it's a waste, a concentrated solution. And through some uh, various steps, um, you can uh, extract the valuable products, remove the, um, the uh, contaminants, and then, and then further process these to make valuable products, which are then can be sold on the market. And this process, um, as shows advantages, particularly around um, the resource consumption. This one shows just the water um, consumption and efficiency compared to other projects like it. And we've come out of the, um, the another hub, which is called um, the uh, ARC um, hub for energy efficient separation, which was uh, is, is still currently is coming to its end. It's at Monash University. And through that, we developed uh, specific parts of the process together. Um, uh, and through, you know, we're taking real feedstocks. So um, that's the major focus is to look at real salts. In this case, these were kringolates in that particular focus, but just reminding that in coming into this hub, uh, we're, we're considering now broader ranges of industrial feedstocks. Um, and we've optimized through, through the development. So development of uh, sort of the innovative process and uh, sort of recovery and um, purification steps and the conditions and these then led to the development the design and build and operation of a pilot plant, um, which is also based at our Werribee campus, uh, which then we have a range of um, product samples, which we demonstrate as outputs from the process. And it's an important part of this project to look at all aspects in relation to its feasibility. Um, so, um, uh, and that was, uh, I guess, coming from Parkway's uh, involvement uh, role in the project. Um, and uh, while we looked at more than just the process uh, itself. <clears throat> so what we're looking at doing and this exciting new opportunity with um, uh, the hubs. So um, uh, between uh, ourselves and, um, and, uh, and Parkway, and we align under fertilizer uh, theme three, which is fertilizer optimization. So um, um, that was put up in uh, uh, Sean's uh, slide about the hub theme, it's a four year project. And we have researchers already ready to go. So we've got Noel Dow um, and Peter Sancioli, um, who um, uh, bring in the wealth of knowledge in uh, uh, laboratory um, work analysis and pilot operation, uh, design and operation. Um, now project is specifically called an integrated water treatment process for valuable nutrient recovery and purification from industrial waste streams. And there's a range of uh, uh, technologies. So I gave the example before, which is very much uh, uh, inorganic or minerals focus, but uh, we're also looking at um, organic processes. And, and I myself uh, separately have uh, been working on other uh, processes and piloting them, for example, ammonia uh, recovery on site uh, from a wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> so we're gonna look at specifically um, innovative aeration and membrane-based technologies, including the MS I showed before. Um, uh, for targeted at specific industrial wastewaters with nutrient value and potential. Um, and the goals will be uh, to, you know, obviously to remove targeted contaminants that uh, compromise these potential values. Um, and, but specifically, as I mentioned before, with uh, Parkways feasibility studies, you know, really looking at um, uh, products. So for example, we could produce fertilizers, including potassium and organic based. Um, so we'll do this uh, through, um, I guess, broadly a similar approach where it's a lot of lab work to optimize um, per points so to develop concepts and, and optimize um, uh, conditions, which we then go ahead and 
look at uh, designing and building and operating and demonstrating on the pilot plan, which is where the feasibility is, is realized. <clears throat> so we have these facilities between us. So um, for those of you who don't know Victoria University, well, if you knew Victoria University, do you know about the Werribee campus? We're um, uh, over here, over near Werribee, so here's Melbourne. Um, if you're familiar with water treatment, you're probably familiar with uh, the um, Werribee treat Western Treatment Plant, which is just here. Um, so, uh, and so we're based here quite close and Parkway's uh, office um, and um, uh, floor, works, uh, floor space is um, based in Sunshine. Um, and together we'll be able to work together quite closely um, to, to do all of the work uh, proposed here. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And I've just got a photo there from the launch of the, the, the Energy Efficient Separation Hub Sean, so it was an exciting event. I'm sure yours will be uh, as exciting and possibly more um, with the ministers and special guests. Um, so uh, looking forward to uh, to seeing you all there. Uh, or if it'll be virtually, will it? I guess not uh, in person. Um, but in any case, uh, get to get a good time to catch up and um, and we'll look forward to working together with you all uh, on this hub, exciting hub. So thank you very much. And thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for keeping me in the time. So, uh, so as as they will leave the questions to the to the the last, uh, and uh, we Kara back. So if Kara yes. your presentation, so we just lost. Yeah, uh, Said was talk briefly about the economics. So, but yeah, you, oh, thanks, Said. Okay, you. thank you, Sharon. Apologies to everyone. I'm not quite sure what happened then. I might might be telling my teenagers to get off their gaming when I'm in the middle of a presentation. Um, so that will be a fun conversation later for them. Mm. Right, moving right along. Um, and thank you, Saeed, for um, uh, filling in there. I'm not too sure where you got to. And I think I talked to myself for a lengthy couple of minutes there. Um, Let's get on with it. So here we go. Get to see all of that again. So here um, is some of those research questions side. I don't know whether you talk to them, but really this is just some of the questions that they're draft at the moment. We haven't really bedded them down, but just to, I guess, just to share our thinking um, is looking at some of these, the key factors that influence the supply and demand of, of the products and services. What are the market benefits? What are the non-market benefits? Um, a year on diversion projects cost effective in terms of the value chain analysis and business cases. So we want to look across the whole of that value chain and there's very there's many moving parts on that. Um, and what financial and regulatory strategies can be applied to promote your division projects at different scales or contexts. So that nicely dovetails into some of the uh, regulatory um, approvals and discussions we'll be having with with our with our friends at the, the state government um, legislation areas. And the way we will look at these methodologies are, are pretty tried and true um, approaches. Uh, some market analysis, non-market valuation, we'll have some stakeholder interviews, key informant interviews, workshops, and so on. And this will be done primarily through, or our work will be done primarily through two separate PhD scholarships. This will be the first one, first cab off the rank. Um, as I say, Queensland Water is our main collaborator with this. Um, and we have we are just finalising our, our PhD student Gan Nguyen, um, who I think will be very very able um, in in this area. So the second, uh, I guess, question was the health-based risk assessments. Professor Anne Royko will be leading this one. Um, and this sits around regulation, but it sits around a, a number of, I guess, different factors. We want to make sure the collection, the, the treatment, um, but, but more so, I guess, that end use and that application and, and where the fate of any contaminants that might be in the urine, where that might go and how they may be um, attenuated or, or removed or, or certainly really lower that risk. Again, there are no guidelines to finding the adequate treatment of, of urine and the safe use of urine-based fertiliser products. And I think this is because when we're talking about urine, we're talking about liquid gold, we're talking about this yellow water, and we, we know how, we know what's in black water. Um, we know what's in grey water, um, but we're still not, we're still, yellow water is a bit more of a moving beast. So it's really looking at a systematic health risk assessment um, to find um, the the efficacy of the, the removals and also any any 
potential effects um, to soil ecology and health, ideally, if we, if we get the time, but certainly that first bit will be for human health. Our collaborators here will be local government, um, Brisbane City Council, we're just working on getting on board. Um, and there'll be other LGAs and, and other state governments and utilities across Queensland, uh, New South Wales, um, possibly Victoria, um, that we'll be working with to really understand um, some of those health risks and, and, and the health concerns from the from the regulatory government as well, from the regulatory departments as well. What are their concerns and how can we address and reduce and minimise that risk? That will be undertaken by a PhD student who we are still um, in the process of um, engaging and chiefly our research methodology will be well our research approach will be looking at um, quantitative microbial risk assessments which Anne um, and her team are very adept at so I won't go into too much detail here there's a little bit about the approach essentially essentially it's looking at this human health risk so it's a risk-based approach um, and we combine that with hazard analysis critical control points this HACCP um, which is looking at at what point along this treatment train um, are there critical points that we need to understand the health risks and manage those health risks um, in order to reduce any, any risks of disease? Um, so that's, that's our second big project. And I think that, again, that will really um, dovetail nicely into our third kind of third area of, of uh, focus, which I'll be looking at. Um, is the regulatory approvals and, and ideally mainstreaming um, these sorts of uh, processes in, into mainstream legislation. And the, the, the rationale for this is, is if you see here, we, we've got the regulator um, at several points across this system with those orange arrows. So across pretty much all part of this, this project, the regulatory bodies will be looking with interest. And I know with my previous experience in this space, um, back in oh, 14, 15 years ago, when we did some work at the Corumban Eco Village around this, uh, where there has been research exemptions um, by our regulatory authorities, we don't want just exemptions. And, and nor, do the, nor do the authorities that we've spoken to so far, they're happy to go, well, let's mainstream this, let's not keep doing ad hoc. Uh, research or short-term approvals. Let's let's truly understand the processes and the risks and what needs to be um, assessed and what needs to be approved, and and let's try and make it happen. So we've had some really positive feedback from our from our stakeholders, um, our relevant stakeholders here. Uh, so again, lots of local government with collaborators, both both from from the hub, and we'll probably be talking to people outside the hub as well. Um, but certainly, Department of Environment Science in Queensland, Energy and Public Works, Queensland New South Wales Health, again, urban utilities have been very helpful, uh, and and will continue to be. So our focus is yep identifying and addressing these regulatory approval requirements. Um, and the approach really is to identify um, the, the components of across that train, that treatment and reuse train, work out some of the timing and the details of the approvals and who needs to do what. Our, our initial work has shown that different approvals will be required for different parts of the process. Um, our first, our first meeting, so sort of mapping that we had here. It's just preliminary mapping, so I probably ask you not to um, take photos and send them around because this is really very draft um, at the moment. Uh, but it's really looking at different stages: the collection, the storage, the processing, the storage of that liquid fertilizer, and then the application of it will require different types of approvals. Um, and we're working through that now. But we've got really good buy-in, and, and there's a really good feel um, from our regulatory friends. Um, they want to make this work, so that's really good. So they're really the three uh, key focus areas for Griffith Uni and other um, hub uh, expertise and our partners. And um, yeah, we're kind of hopefully covering, as I say in, in, our, in my title, um, really looking at that systems approach to what other parts of this, this um, really tying in together some, some various parts of this systems thinking around um, this, this nice hub. Uh, and there's a nice picky of Anne and Syed um, because you've seen my face and there are three, three researchers at Griffith Uni. Um, so I will leave it at that. And hopefully when we talk more in November, we might have a, a second PhD student on board and a little bit more to um, discuss. Thanks, Sheriff. Thank you, Gara. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have enough time to do the discussion. So if you have any questions, 
I didn't see any questions here. Uh, so, but yeah, it is open to to the discussion now. So I uh, just before before you prepare for your own questions, I uh, just have just to start the the discussion here. So, Carla, you talked a lot of uh, a very diverse um, portfolio for this uh, nice research hub and uh, and all this economics and then then the value chain and also in <clears throat> and all this uh, risk assessment and so the regulatory ones. So when you talked all about, for example, especially about the regulatory ones, you get a lot of um, data to back up your, uh, 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 let's say, approval processes. So mm -hmm. how how you're going to be collaborating with the other the, the hub members, uh, CIs, because you probably require a lot of uh, um, data for, from the risk assessment, the safety, and then also the technology, how it works, what's the characteristic, I mean, the, yep. the characteristics of the fertilizer, and even the pro probably the process, how it is done. Yes. So, you, so you just want to have you know, what, what sort of uh, idea you have for collaboration, cross collaboration, and also, you know, what sort of uh, support that you are, uh, uh, you know, looking from the the hub to 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 improve this cross collaboration. So yeah, if you can just uh, share yep. a light on this one. No, that's 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 a good point you make, Sheriff. And that is the beauty of being in a hub that has the seven universities, twenty three industry partners, and three international partners. Is that there is a lot of data and expertise um, out there that we can draw upon and, and use. So the first thing, but how to do it, that's right, exactly. Um, it's always easy to say, well, we can, but doing it's always a, a harder thing. Um, but some of my thoughts around that is we, we're going to have uh, a second meeting now that we've, we've mapped out kind of the different parts of that train that will need specific regulatory approvals. This, the second thing is to then nut out again probably we'll have one more meeting just with those key regulatory stakeholders about the exact information what is good enough information and really they've asked, they've asked us will you tell us because they don't know uh, you tell us what you think you we might need to know about um different parts of that different parts of the, the the process train and then we can then once we we've kind of clarified that a bit we can then go to the relevant partners um, within the hub and probably ask we'll give a bit of a wish list to yourself Cherub or, or, or the whoever's the, the hub manager um, and and say okay these are the types of things we need to know this is the data we need to know um, and then have some sort of a, and I hate to say it, an online workshoppy type thing um, where we get a bit of a whiteboard together and I get a feel for who is holding what data and, and how we can use that to, to bring together some, some really good um, information to go back to our regulatory authorities and say, okay, this is the bounds, this is the maximum minimum of, of what might occur in terms of, um, and, and that's something else we have to work out with our health risk assessment as well, is that some of that data we don't quite know um, as well. So it'll be a bit of a moving dynamic thing, but, but I would say firstly, identify exactly the type of data, and then secondly, make a call out um, based on some of the information that we'll learn from today and that you'll know uh, who holds what and then get together um, and have a bit of a, an online discussion and, and whiteboarding around that just just off the top of my head but it's a good point you make and I and and it's definitely there'll be quite a bit of consultation but. okay that's great yes I I can see that uh, many people are nodding head because there's a lot of opportunities for your group to collaborate with others mm. with a lot of things that you can share with each other because uh, it's because your work probably some of the works rely on the, the data from the other the cis so uh well, thank you uh, for, yeah so before i go to other questions so i let's have a photo session because i forgot to do that earlier uh maybe if you can everyone can put on your camera and that just i can screenshot uh uh, so that yeah, we'll have a record of what we have done. Okay. Yeah, so I'm here. Are you there? Looks like yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> oh, there are two of you. Okay. 
okay just hold on let me screenshot okay everyone uh one two three smile everyone just hold on one more just in case if someone closes their eyes okay one more where is this okay one two three smile okay thank you very much uh, okay so now let's uh, i want to open the questions for uh, other audience so if anyone wants to raise any questions yeah you're welcome so kara just uh, wondering that when you focused on the urine the your overall health risk assessment also your research approach so when you have uh, this kind of approach to the like industrial wastewater so michael duke he collaborated with the the parkway then they are very much focused on the wastewater, especially the industry, like a protein way, daily wastewater. Also, they produce a lot of wastewater for the fertilizer, potassium based, organic based. So this concept you mentioned about specifically urine, whether this can go to the also Michael's uh, fertilizer production uh, concept as well. Like uh, he's uh, talking about daily wastewater and the fertilizer production. So how this will differ from the urine approach? Was that to me, Sean? Yes, yes. Sorry, was. sorry. I hadn't quite I hadn't <laughs> quite put my um, headphones back on um, from our from our paparazzi event. Um, it's good point. I mean, it probably won't. I don't know. It, it probably won't differ that much, and and certainly um, that will be. Yeah, that's a good point. But you're probably more of a comment there, I think, or or or, or a gentle suggestion. I, I I get together and talk to Michael about that, and and I certainly will because I think there'll be a lot of a lot of um, alignment there. I think. Um, as I was saying earlier, talking when I got the research exemptions, the regulatory guys um, earlier. Uh, a few years back, it was because they just didn't know quite where to put this this urine box, this this yellow water box, because particularly with the pharmaceuticals and all of this, um, the antimicrobial resistant um, contaminants and so on and so for pollutants and so on. So there is, I think, one of the things that might differ, maybe not, but is is that lack of known. There's just this feeling from the, the health guys that it's just an unknown quantity, whereas perhaps um, the other the other waste streams you mentioned is a bit more of a known quantity. I, I don't know, but I certainly will. I'd love to hear from, from Michael about that as well um, and certainly don't want to reinvent the wheel or, or make more work for ourselves. So that's an, another good point, John. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Karen. I think, you know, what you're doing is really important. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, working across various sectors. One I'm more familiar with is, you know, the use of uh, reuse of in, uh, wastewater and the guidelines mm -hmm. and the regulators mm -hmm. associated mm -hmm. with that. But, you know, we've been also working in foods and, and I'm interested, Sean, like you, you put up your um, process where you're irrigating um, uh, like lettuce or something, right? I mean, um, is there a certain point where it gets into some sort of foods? Um, uh, regulations as well and what you can do because I know there are certain times where you don't need to do anything if if they if uh, but no there is a catch that as soon as you produce if it's a waste and you you treat it then you have to start following uh, uh, certain guidelines and so forth so it's it's a very much case by case as to who, yeah. who you need to activate but we'd like yeah. to consider all because we're crossing a quite a few industries yeah. here yeah yeah yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Sean, what did you think? What are just in your one with the, with the lettuce? I mean, before you start eating that, <laughs> is there anything you need to do? <laughs> Maybe it I doesn't think, matter yeah. if it's all, a, you know, just for you, right? <laughs> I think that that's the one of the good uh, expanded uh, research activity from the Griffiths University. So we just focus on urine, but now it's uh, another opportunity. Your fertilizer can be from the industrial wastewater source, like a daily cheese or some other potassium based or some of the lake, I don't know, the halasite or silivite or leonite, this kind of all the uh, lake from the fertilizer or so industrial for wastewater fertilizer. So how this can make a little bit more health risk as so 
with uh, some of the uh, guidelines we can make uh, happen to commercialize the, your product. So that's the uh, collaboration the CARA can work with the yeah, mm, Korea yeah. University and that you can make uh, some more expanded uh, yeah, scope of the, this project. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. And, I, and as I was thinking too, and I saw your talk, Kara, that once um, you know, we've uh, given, you know, started to lay down some some applications, um, you know, those sorts of things are going to emerge. So I really see, you know, we're still at the beginning of something really cool. So, so yeah. yeah, it's good to have that contact. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's good. Yep. It's good to hear your talk too, actually. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Also, my, <laughs> yeah, Michael, yes, based on the, your presentation, still, I'm not really 100% sure the potassium based fertilizer. So where is this uh, main potassium fertilizer is from? Which kind of uh, water, wastewater source you have? Also, you mentioned about halasite and the sylvite and the leonite oh, uh, from yeah. the okay. old precipitate. So this is the based on the what kind of fertilizer you are producing? Okay, yeah, okay, technology? okay, that's right. I'm so used to calling them by their um, uh, crystal names that uh, their common names that I forgot. Halite's just sodium chloride, <laughs> sylvite's potassium chloride, <laughs> and of course um, SOP is potassium sulfate. Um, so, so, so th that's sort of really coming out of um, the potassium focus was really coming out of uh, the prior that that project with um, focus at Kringer Lakes where that was the focus. But the process itself, um, through its various steps that we had to develop um, and optimize all of them, um, can actually target different elements or different minerals for different applications. Potassium is certainly a focus, um, but it can target others. So, if um, you know, and that's the, the where the, the focus is right now is um, we've got a few industries in mind and if the, there's a mineral aspect of it, the process can use, uh, uh, can, can basically extract um, uh, the min minerals of interest that to highlight in those and there's different ones. And um, but we're also looking at organics as well. So the potassium in that particular case um, was sourced from uh, Salt Lake brines, right? Um, and through the process, it through multiple steps um, produces potassium sulfate or potash, which is is it, which is a fertilizer product. So it, it went all the way through. Do you have any specific application of the, your fertilizer uh, in your mind? Have you ever? Seen <laughs> <of it? laughs> well, the, the, once it's a, a potash at a certain grade, it just becomes market to. I mean, potash is a very well-known fertilizer. So I think, um, you know, if it could be used, yeah, that's right. If this, if anyone's uh, got a particular place they want to use it, but uh, it's it's meeting certain requirements as commercial potash. So it should be the same as where you buy potash normally. Yeah. But that's actually, you know, one thing that uh, could be really cool. So what we, you know, if there's a particular demand for some fertilizers. Um, or interest for fertilizers, um, you know, that can also help uh, design some of the aspects of the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, for the four speakers? Okay, so um, I, because we have uh, some uh, new, I mean, other CIs who I haven't introduced. So I just want to uh, take this time to introduce because all the speakers, they 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 already introduced themselves uh, while speaking. So I want to introduce uh, uh, the other CIs. Um, Leonard, maybe you can just oh Leonard will do it during his session time. Uh, Professor Biggie, so you want to briefly introduce. Yeah, uh, you're muted. Yes. Uh, I have been with uh, UTS for the last uh, 31 years, and I've been uh, fortunate to work with Sean and uh, all the number of uh, uh, professors at UTS. And uh, in this particular project, I will be helping the UTS uh, researchers as well as UTS CIs, as well as uh, other CIs on the 
membrane bioreactor based pretreatment or any other membrane based or physicochemical based pretreatment systems to reduce the fouling and especially the biofouling. And I also will try to sort of work on the automation aspects. So I have been closely working with uh, um, uh, Sean and I will be working with uh, Sharuf and Leonard. So I'll be sort of for all the time with you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So I'll go to next side if you can briefly introduce because I you speak, spoke earlier, but yeah, if you can introduce. Sure. Hi, I'm Said Iftakhar. I'm uh, based here in the Griffith Business School. By training, I'm an applied and environmental economist. Um, as I mentioned before, I'll be working on the whole of system economics project here, which is called O1, if I remember correctly. So we'll be looking at um, what Kara has already said, that we'll be looking at uh, the total value and business cases of these types of products and services, urine-based products. And but we'll try to focus, uh, incorporate more of the non-market value part because the market part like market data often is quite easily available, but it's difficult is to, what is the demand and what is the, how much people are willing to pay for these kind of sustainable practices. That would be the challenge. And that's why we'll focus more on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Uh, we have, okay, Bezat, yeah, I want to introduce. Bezat, are you there? Okay, seems she's not here. Uh, who are the one? Uh, and Dana will be introducing because he'll be, she will be presenting so she can introduce herself later on. So any other, I, I can't find a name, Nigger's phone and Virus Kusoki. Any other CIS want to introduce because I cannot. Jason. Uh, Jason will be presenting, right? Okay. Yeah, this will be presenting. There are two Jasons, or we have only one Jason, right? From <laughs> UTS. Oh, you have other Jason from other university, yeah? Griffith is of where? Uh, okay, let's see. Jason. Ah, uh, Janus. Jason Reynolds. Uh, are you here? If you can present. Uh... Uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, uh, I'm Jason Reynolds. Uh, Jeff Powell will be talking later on about our work, but uh, I've focused uh, for the past few years on putting recycled water and uh, biosolids onto the soils in and around Western Sydney. So those aspects around uh, potential hazards uh, a, hot, a hot topic in the Sydney Basin at the moment uh, and Sydney water is the major water utility in, in the Sydney region and uh, they've been funding a lot of our research so uh, we're very interested in issues around uh, placing these products uh, onto the soil surface and watching to see what happens both directly to the crop system or the horticultural system and to the okay thank you thank you Jason uh any other any other uh cis okay uh Jillian was here he's, he's gone looks like okay that's fine uh ibrahim i do uh can you introduce briefly yourself yeah. hi <clears throat> hi i'm ibrahim salibi i some of you know i work for the botanic garden i've been helping sean uh, with this project in the last few month and we've been collaborating with uh, UTS for the last 10 years uh, using fertilizers from FO technology first then we used recently the herbal and growing uh, lettuce and bok choy in vertical garden and in hydroponics and we also tested the fertilizer on uh, parsley and uh, some ornamental plants so yeah, my background is agriculture and I've worked in water treatment for a period of time and then in horticulture. So I'm trying to use all this knowledge to help Sean achieve the targets of the project. Thanks. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, Bezan, are you there? Okay. 
okay so basically it's not here so yeah if you have any questions we still have few uh, we can allow a few minutes uh, to further discuss any burning questions for the our four speakers mm -hmm. Hello, it's uh, VG again. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So, I have been speaking to these uh, industry people. They are asking the question whether the system which we are going to develop or we are in the process of developing, uh, whether it can be retrofitted in the existing infrastructure or it is only applicable to the new in infrastructure. Okay, uh, Sean or Stefano wants to uh, share on this one? I think the uh, we can, that's the one of the, our objective of the, this uh, AIC NICE hub. So we are considering the retrofitting system because this is more cost effective rather than just building the new and then just install the, our urine divergence system. So retrofitting existing toilet system, how we can make a cost-effective way of the urine diversion. So that's the, yeah, currently, yeah, ongoing the project objective. Also that's the possible, depending on the, what's the building, you have uh, your own toilet system. So we will, yeah, consider this one, and then this is possible, but depending on the your toilet system, so that uh, we can uh, make sure that the more cost effective in terms of the our urine diversion and fertilizer production and application system when you have a retrofitting, or if it's not really uh, uh, cost effective as well as the some of the. Uh, safety concern of the building structure. So we don't recommend the retrofitting. So it depends on the how your toilet system looks like for your building. I think that uh, I agree with Sean. Uh, it really depends on the building. It's very hard to retrofit the high rise, impossible. But uh, I think the transition towards urine diversion is not going to be one that will be over five years. It's going to be most likely over 20, 30 years. So I think that uh, at the end of the cycle, hopefully new buildings that uh, we come up will be designed with urine aversion uh, already from the start. So, so that at that stage, we'll be moving into a full circular economy. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for sticking to this first session. So we'll have short break. Uh, so probably five minutes should be fine, I think. So we'll resume at uh, 3, uh, 340, 352, 53 or 352. Uh, let's make it 355 here, yeah. Oh, 355, okay, that's fine, 355. Yes, uh, please have coffee or, or whatever you want. So we resume at 355, thank you very much.
All right. Um, hello again, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So we're going to start our second session. Um, let me introduce myself first. I'm not sure if everybody's here already. Um, may I just check? Um, there's a lot of people without videos. So I just would like to know if you are there so that we can start properly. Can you just show yourself for just a bit and then, all right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. So um, again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leonard Ting. I'm a senior lecturer from the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm also one of the CIs of this um, hub. But at the same time, I'm also the acting hub manager for now. Um, I guess many of you may know my name already. And this is the first time for some of you to see my face. But I'm that annoying guy who's always chasing you up for reminders and getting Hanisher C's and all of these agreements. So, a uh, good thing we're almost there, or we're going to start our hubs very, very soon. So still, you will not, um, I will not stop uh, sending emails anyway. Um, anyway, um, before we go to our second session, I would like to first um, also acknowledge some of the people that were with us today. Um, just to give uh, a brief of introduction from, from people, um, just for everybody to, be, to know each other. Um, aside from the speakers, I'll just have to ask, um, may we know um, uh, the, the one with U, U1058119, if you could possibly introduce yourself, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, I, I caught you, uh, you are eating a bit, but um, yeah. <laughs> Hello, you there? Yes, I am muted. Yes, please. So yeah. I'm, May I, I'm Serhi Marchuk from University of Southern Queensland, and I'm working with Professor Bernadette Macabe on application of different organic amendments to soil. So my speciality is uh, I'm a soil scientist, so I do all the field work and research with soil. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, sorry, I, we did it. What's, what's your first name again? What was that? Serhi Marchuk. Okay. Um, it's a little bit hard for me to probably pronounce the last name, but yeah, welcome to the hub uh, for Thank this uh, summit. Yes. Um, oh, Bizad is here. Can you please introduce a brief uh, introduction of yourself, Bizad? Thank you. Um, yes, sure. Uh, uh, Good to see everyone. I'm uh, Bezat Fatai. I'm the associate professor at UTS in Civil and Environmental Engineering School. And I work uh, with another colleague, and I'm a CI working on use of the <clears throat> treated urine for improvement of the soil under our infrastructure, actually. So we would like to reduce the cement usage and bring urine for treatment of the material, make them stronger and more durable for road, airport, uh, railway construction. So I will interact with you more and very fascinating field actually for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bizad. Um, uh, there are some more people here. Can you please introduce yourself, uh, Chi, Chi Shang Chen? Um, hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm a PhD student under uh, Dr. Stefano. I'm from uh, Uni University of Melbourne. So currently, I'm I'm under the supervision of Dr. Stefano, been doing the impact of urine diversion to the sewage treatment plant, as well as the, our sewage system. And we wish to quantify whether the urine diversion is impact to the removal of micropolitans. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. It's good to see that some patient students are actually joining us here today. Um, thank you. Um, Joe, jo Janice, Antio, are you there? Dio, Janice, Antio, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, Dio Antile, I'm from CSRO, based at Canberra. Um, I am within the Soils and Landscape group here, and I got an exchange position with USQ in Toowoomba. So working with Professor Bernard McCabe. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dio Dennis, and welcome. Um, we have Vera Kuskoi, please. Yes, hello. Good morning from Finland. Um, I'm from Tampere University. 
I'm just about to finish my PhD here. Uh, Stefano is one of my supervisors for my PhD. And um, while I'm not officially a part of the hub as of yet, um, but um, I have a, a long history or well, my PhD has been focusing on nutrient recovery using these bioelectrochemical systems. Thank so you, I'm, thank you. Very much. Oh, sorry, sorry about that, go ahead, yeah. No, nice to meet you all and good to be here. Thank you, thank you, um, Vera, and nice to meet you as well. Um, Aline, please, Aline Duspaso Silva. Yeah, hello, everybody. So I'm a master's student here at UNUSQ. Um, I'm working with um, Professor Benedict McBee and then Sahi as well here at the Center of Agricultural Engineering. Um, so we're going to be participating in this project as well. Thank you, Aline. Um, Nigar, please, Nigar. Nigars. Yeah. 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 Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be in, uh, in this meeting. Um, so I'm uh, Negar Dasine and uh, under uh, supervision of Dr. Stefano, uh, I've started my PhD journey. So what uh, uh, I'm working is uh, nutrient recovery based on bioelectrochemical uh, technology and electrodialysis. Um, so we mainly focusing on um, basically comparing these technologies and uh, trying to improve the performance to um, produce uh, a very um, uh, high quality fertilizer um, uh, for the land uh, application. Thank you, Anigar. Um, we have a few more. Um, it's okay because we, we, we are missing one speaker later on, so we are we're just on time. Um, we have um, Omakan, just a short uh, introduction. Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Omakan. I'm a PhD student at UTS under the supervision of uh, Sharub and Sham. And I work on uh, impact of urine diversion on uh, wastewater treatment. Thank you, Omakan. Uh, Jay, please. Ja Jiangxi. Jiangxi. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Jesse Jiang, you can call me Jade. So I'm a PhD student under the supervision of Professor Sean and Dr. Shira. So um, my research interest is to use uh, my uh, bioreactors to treat the salt separated urine. Thanks. Thank you, Jade and Wan Jun. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Won Jung Son. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student under Professor Sean Sporvita, and I'm working on the urine nitrification in a membrane bioreactor and further concentration by RO of, to produce the fertilizer. Uh, yeah, happy to meet you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Won Jung. And I think the last one is Abdul. Are you there? Yes, yes. Hi everyone, uh, I am Abdul Aziz Mutashiri from uh, Saudi Arabia. Currently, I'm a PhD student at the University of Technology in Sydney under Dr. Shurub and uh, Professor Sean uh, uh, Supervision. I'm working on removal of pharmaceuticals from uh, urine uh, by using a granular activated carbon. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Abdul. So I guess um, I've called everyone. I'm not sure if I miss anyone here, aside from the speakers, the remaining speakers. So I'll be introducing anyway the remaining speakers for the rest, for the rest of the afternoon. All right, for this session, we have um, supposedly four speakers, but unfortunately, one of the, the last speaker is, has an, a medical emergency for the family. So she's not able to come here from uh, Liu University of Queensland. Three speakers. Uh, in fact, four speakers. We have two speakers in the first part, and then um, the, the next one would be, um, uh, yeah, following speakers for, for the next two one. All right, so the first um, speakers we have for this afternoon would be uh, Professor Jason Pryor and um, Professor Dana Corda. Um, are you seeing the right view, the correct view? Yeah, yeah, sure, yep. it's good. Okay, um, cool, uh, thanks, Leonard. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so at Western Sydney University, like like most of the um, all of the other presenters, um, the work that's being done in each of the different groups, it's it's definitely teamwork. 
Um, so at, at Western Sydney Uni, it's myself um, and Jason Reynolds. So we're both largely focused within theme four, which is um, fertilizer end use. So we're one of the groups that's, that's um, largely focused within that theme. You're gonna be hearing um, Bernadette scheduled to speak after me. So you're gonna be hearing from one of the other groups that's largely focused within that theme. Um, Jason and I have complementary skills. Um, we both have a very soil centric approach to our research. Um, Jason from a geochemical side, uh, myself from a biological side. Um, and both of those different aspects work together to um, influence soil biological fertility um, and how nutrients interact um, with the organisms that are living in soil and the, um, the physical and chemical structure of soil. Um, because we have this um, soil centric focus, um, so a lot, much of the research that we're going to be focusing on is trying to quantify benefits associated with um, urine based fertilizers. And because we have this soil centric focus, it, it really, we see it as really depending on the context in which the, the fertilizers are being applied. Um, so in very productive soils um, that are well drained, um, these are the types of um, systems that we've largely been hearing about. So um, soils that are used for agricultural horticultural production, um, where the, the benefits are largely around production of biomass. So, okay, so growing, um, growing more forage, um, growing larger trees, growing more fruit, et cetera. Um, with also a, a potential side benefit of actually adding more soil to carbon. And that's something that I'll be coming back to later on in the talk. Um, there are specific issues associated with these soils as well. Look, these, these issues are um, um, associated with urine-based fertilizers, but, but in some cases they're associated with fertilizers in general. Um, so one of, one of our aims will be to determine whether some of the issues that we're facing applying urine-based fertilizers to soil, um, whether, they're, whether they're unique to these fertilizers or it's just a consequence of, of fertilizer use. And so these, in those well-drained soils, it would be um, issues associated with leaching um, or losses of nutrients via other means, so ammonification or um, incomplete nitrogen cycling. Um, and so um, in general, um, in soils like that, um, what we're going to be focusing on is trying to really understand the behavior of those nutrients what, once they end up in soil, what's their What's their behavior in terms of the degree to which they they absorb to to the soil particles? Um, um, what's the capacity of the organisms that live in soil to take them up and to assimilate them, um, et cetera? But then we've got a whole bunch of other different soils, um, um, soils that are used for agriculture or horticulture, but but are really quite marginal. Um, and so um, in, uh, in and around Sydney, we work on a lot of soils that have really poor drainage. Um, um, and um, when we're growing plants on those soils, um, one of the key issues will be um, reduced plant health as a result of presumably increased salinization of those soils. Um, and we're, we're keenly interested in ways in which we could potentially mediate that. So for example, if we could modify rates of, of fertilizer application or timing of fertilizer application or choosing what plants we're using for um, forage production or for, for veggie production, et cetera. And then we've got our really damaged soils. And so we, um, there hasn't really been much of a focus on on these types of systems yet, but we think that there's an opportunity here. 
to to really help um, to restore and help soils to recover. So we've been working on some um, really um, heavily impacted soils in Western Sydney, um, quite compacted, um, very low nutrient availability, very low carbon content, very low biological fertility. Um, and we think that there's an opportunity here to um, use some of these products to really enhance um, the recovery of these soils. Um, and so there's some research needs associated with those. Um, I'm going to contextualize some of these um, just by referring to some of the work that Jason and I have been doing um, um, with Sydney Water, um, where we've been looking at um, wastewater and recycled water and, and, and how it can be used to, uh, whether it can be used and to the extent that it can help improve soils. So this is, um, this is uh, a couple of photos from one of our field sites. So these, this is a paddock. You can see that it's, um, that it's irrigated. We've got some irrigation heads all throughout the background. Um, we've been um, describing these soils, describing the characteristics of these soils, um, as well as um, looking at using using these um, um, lysimeters that we've been uh, making out of these soils to look at the behavior of nutrients that are present within the, the water sources that we're using um, and the impact of those on the whole soil system. And so this is, um, we've been looking at this across a range of soils. So we have some of our more productive soils. So here you can see one um, where we see the top 30 centimeters, there's quite a bit of organic content in that soil. Um, this would be a, a, a soil where um, perhaps we want to um, utilize these fertilizers in order to, to enhance um, the productivity of the system. The system. Um, we've got some other soils that we're looking at um, really um, challenging soils to work with. Um, so in this case, um, this is a soil from around Penrith. Um, they have been trying to plant trees in this soil for a while with very low success rates. Um, and so one of um, our, our aims in, in terms of working in the, this, these other projects that we've been working with is seeing if we can improve these soils to increase the success rate um, of those plantings. Um, and then um, here's another example of another soil. It's a very poor structure um, in both the surface layers. And as you can see um, deeper down in the soil, there's poor vegetation um, cover here. In both of these last two soils that I mentioned, um, we've identified that there's actually a, a lot of opportunity here, um, um, particularly with regard to building up soil carbon um, in these soils. And that um, uh, when you do that, you actually, you actually enhance the fertility of those, the biological fertility of those soils as well. Um, and so that's, um, that's one of our aims is to try to to quantify the degree to which we can we can enhance those things. Um, so one of the aspects that we're looking at is um, so how can we mediate nutrient losses from from these systems using um, where we're applying um, urine-based fertilizers? So that can be via those losses come can come via le leaching and runoff. Um, the key issues. Um, um, associated with those have to do with the physical nature of the soil, its texture, how much organic matter is it, how much compact, how to what degree it's compacted, and and to what extent do do roots and and microorganisms grow within those soils? And so, approaches that we might take using these fertilizers is to um, 
experimental approaches that we might take to um, see the extent we can maximize or minimize these issues is to change input rates, um, add these fertilizers in addition to other organic amendments. Um, um, plant choice is also an important thing there as well. Um, the, the other two bullet points here relate to other aspects of the work that we're um, planning on doing. I won't get too in depth into that, um, except to say that um, uh, we do want to focus on doing what we can to see how we can make sure that the, these plants are making the most of the, the nutrients that we're providing and that we're not actually creating no, more problems related to the um, uh, evolution of greenhouse gases. Um, we don't actually want to, um, to, in, to enhance those things. Um, I mentioned um, with regard to this potential associated with improving soil carbon. So that, again, this is relating to the work that Jason and I have been doing um, with Sydney Water. So these are um, four, four of the soils that we've been working with. Um, and this some preliminary data that we have here where we've been um, showing the degree to which we can build soil carbon by adding um, storm water or two, one of two different sources of, of recycled water. And just over a, a relatively short period of time, over a few months, um, we've been able to see um, some increase in soil carbon. And so one of the things that we would like to do is to see if we can, we can enhance that um, using, using these fertilizers. Um, something that's really promising the image on the right. Um, so this is showing how much um, this is showing microbial this is showing microbial biomass carbon. Um, so the extent to which we get an increase in some of those organisms that live in the soil and um, and interact with those nutrients as well. And so in some of the poorer soils that I've been showing you, we can actually um, uh, see some pretty large improvements in that in that biological fertility. And then the other aspect is I mentioned already salinity. Um, and so um, one of the aspects that um, another aspect that we've we'd like to look at is in some of these soils where um, salinity might be important, which are the which are the um, um, what are some plants is, is that, does the choice of plants that we're using in these systems um, um, influence um, their capacity to tolerate increases in salinity and are they able to to utilize those um, the nutrients and the fertilizers efficiently um, so just a, a last slide it's just a brief summary um, so there's there's lots of benefits potential benefits associated with these um, with these fertilizers, um, there's also a, a lot of potential trade-offs associated with them. So in some soil systems, um, some of the benefits that um, we might get might trade off against um, um, un some undesired outcomes that we might have. Um, and, and yeah, so this, uh, we really need to think about for particular soil systems, what is our, what is our goal? Um, so for a, a healthy well draining soil, um, we might have one, one goal, um, but we do have a, a lot of opportunity to actually try to repair soil as well. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, yeah, for keeping the time as well, thank you. All right, um, so for the next one, uh, we have um, Professor uh, Bernadette McCabe. Um, unfortunately, she sent her apologies uh, for this afternoon's um, session, but uh, she sent her recorded video. So we'll be receiving to a recorded video for her uh, plan and project. And Cheryl, will you please um, share that video? And I think some of the students coming from University of Southern Queensland are here as well. So, yeah.
Welcome to this afternoon session on the first Nutrients in a Circular Economy Summit 2022. My name is Professor Bernadette McCain and I am the Director at the University of Southern Queensland's Centre for Agricultural Engineering. You can hear me, right? Here but here the video, right? Today, yeah, yes, it's okay. an overview of the uh, work that we will be conducting as part of the ARC NICE Hub, and that is regarding the optimization of urine derived and biosolids derived biofertilizers. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the project team. I will be leading the project as chief investigator. And uh, we also have a um, support from a co investigator, Dr. Dio Antil, who is an adjunct research fellow at the Centre for Agricultural Engineering at UniSQ, but is based with the CSIRO Food and Agriculture Business Unit in Canberra. We also have Dr. Serge Marchuk, who is a research fellow within the Energy and Bioresource Recycling team at the Centre for Ag Agriculture Engineering, and also the support of Ms. Alini Dos Pazos Silva, who are also providing research assistance along the way. Now, the biofertilizer work is contained in two work packages. Work package one, which aligns with project 4.3 in the ARC hub, will look to evaluate and demonstrate UGOLD and herbal efficacy in field trials. And we'll be partnering with urban utilities. Work package two, is Logan Home Biosolids Gasification Project, which has received the support, financial support from Pyrocal, PTY LTD, and also Logan Water and Logan City Council. Both Work Package 1 and Work Package 2 will be uh, providing information around the, um, the usefulness of both urine derived fertilizers and uh, biosolids derived biochar, which is going to be really important in um, understanding end of waste codes. So both work packages will be working closely with Queensland's Department of Environment and Science. Just looking now over to project objectives, I'll first of all look at work package one, which is looking at the evaluation and demonstration of new gold and herbal efficacy in field trials. This work package has two main objectives. The first one is to develop the specifications for novel urine derived biofertilizer products that firstly meet the requirements for field application from a physical property perspective. And then secondly, uh, looking at a biofertilizer product that also meets nutritional needs of plants. And therefore we'll be focusing on the chemical composition side of things there. The second aim of work package one for urine derived biofertilizers is to experimentally evaluate the proposed formulation and product format to determine the fertilizer replacement value or FRV of the urine derived biofertilizer products and develop guidelines for use on crops and parklands. The second work po project is called the Logan Home Biosolids Gasification Project. And again, under two main effort uh, project objectives, we'll firstly look at understanding the effect of a conversion technology called the continuous carbonization technology on heavy metals content and mobility in a byproduct. Firstly, by assessing the potential risks due to heavy metals, namely zinc, chromium, copper, nickel, and lead. And then looking at the nutrient um, effects primarily nitrogen and phosphorus leaching in soil treated with the byproduct. The second aim of work package two will look to determine the suitability of the byproduct as a biofertilizer. We'll be doing this by looking at two key areas. Firstly, the nutrient availability of N, P, and K from the byproduct to soil. And secondly, the byproduct as a potential fertilizer with respect to plant yield by determining the agronomic response in interconnected 
interconnected studies involving glasshouse and field experiments. In terms of the methodology, I thought I'd just outline it by four points, which will be generically applied to both work package one and two. So first of all, we'll be undertaking an agricultural requirements analysis by comparing both the biofertilizer against the inorganic fertilizers. And this is important both from a contamination point of view and also a nutrient point of view. So in regard to heavy metals, we'll be also assessing the heavy metal contents of um, synthetic fertilizers as well, as this will become important when we're assessing regulatory guidelines. We we'll then secondly develop product chemical and physical specifications that will help to inform the product development of both the urine derived biofertilizer and biosolids derived biofertilizer. And then from those um, uh, specifications, we'll look to evaluate the proposed formulation by conducting agronomic studies at both field and glasshouse scales. And then with all of these points combined, we'll provide results, which will then go into the development of guidelines for efficient and safe use of both biofertilizer materials. If we look at the first point of our methodology, we'll be looking at uh, contamination studies um, in terms of the heavy metals, particularly around the biosolids derived biochar. And then we'll also look at the agronomic performance, um, particularly around nutrients in glasshouse trials. And so we can see here at the top um, image to the left, we have um, facilities in the laboratory, which will um, be undertaking in terms of leaching experiments. Uh, we will be conducting those primarily to assess heavy metal mobility in biosolids derived biochar. And to the right here, we have an image of the types of glasshouse trials that we will be conducting in our, our facilities. And these will be uh, done to determine the yield to nutrient response relationships for both the biofertilized materials that we will be investigating in work package one and two, and then to compare with the standard mineral fertilizers such as urea. And if we look at the glasshouse trials, we have uh, previously conducted trials with biofertilizers, uh, which uh, have utilized ryegrass. And we utilize, um, we use rye grass because of its ability to grow quickly and the ability to obtain multiple cups in a short period of time. So we'd be looking at setting these up quite um, um, soon, and probably to, um, in order to take the right um, season, we'll be looking to set it up around mid August and run it right through, through to summer. And what we'll be doing is taking dry yields from all those treatments that we were doing and recording monthly in order to establish relationships with the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus supplied. So we'll be doing these both for uh, urine derived fertilizers and also biosolids derived biofertilizers. In terms of the field scale trials, we'll be looking at both using sites here at USQ and so if you look at the top uh, right-hand corner here, we have um, sufficient land available here at the Toowoomba campus so that we have a ag plot just outside of our building, which is quite um, fortunate. Uh, we will be able to uh, then plant different crops um, and also assess these um, sites at, um, around Brisbane and also parklands. In these field trials, we look to compare um, biofertilizers with urea to assess three main areas um, of interest. First one is to assess the productivity over a long-term, um, say four seasons worth of crop, um, given the duration of the project. We'd also be looking to assess the soil resilience of the uh, uh, soils for which we are applying the biofertilizer. And then also to assess the heavy metal buildup in soil or the recovery in grain or biomass. As the uh, project goes on, we would also be looking at other uh, contaminants, um, namely around, say, microplastics or emerging um, uh, pollutants or the persistent organic pollutants, 
um, as well. So I would just like to end on a very um, high level uh, note in terms of the industry benefits and outcomes of doing this type of optimization of the biofertilizers. Because once we have understood exactly what the um, you know, monetary value is and to also make sure we have the right guidelines, this could present a potential income stream through the sales of the product and licensing of the technology or enabling for reduced um, or you know, avoided costs associated with disposal by increasing agricultural recycling. Another benefit is also to reduce farmers' reliance on mineral fertilizers. And this also could go toward um, not just um, the agricultural sector, but the peri-urban sector as well, and also parklands and the horticultural sector. As we know, we're living in times of looking at um, a, a you know, fertilizer crisis in terms of the price of urea. And so they're obviously likely to go up even more in price. And so with the associated benefits in terms of nutrient and organic recovery, we will um, also realize this in terms of the actual, um, you know, opening up markets to biofertilizers into the future. And lastly, there will we could assess a monetary value in relation to the sale of the product based on the overall urea fertilizer market in Australia, which is estimated at around about $1 billion um, Australian dollars. And as I mentioned, uh, the biofertilizer market is set to only increase into the future um, as recent international studies have reported. So um, that's just a general overview of our um, work that we are going to conduct as part of the ARC Nutrients in a Circular Economy uh, Hub. We are really looking forward to commencing this project with our project partners. And I've got my details there below if there are any questions to follow up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... For that recorded a video from Bernadette. So we actually have uh, completed our afternoon session. So uh, unfortunately, Professor Liu Ye, Ye from University of Queensland uh, is not able to come today. So she's sending her apologies uh, for this today's session. So we come down now for the floor is open for questions. Um, is there any questions or comments from the group uh, with regards to the presentations from the, um, from the presenters this afternoon? For the second uh, session. Uh, Lena, can I ask a question from Jeff? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, that was Jeff Pavel. Yes, thank you for presentation. I just uh, was wondering, uh, have you uh, thought or before looked at changes in the, the stiffness or compaction of the soil also? Like not just biochemistry of it, but how it may stiffen. Thank you. Um, no, we, we haven't we haven't measured that. Um, is there a reason why you're asking? Oh, uh, I just uh, I mentioned you know like in this hub we have this interest of using the treated urine and with some additives, bacteria and so on to stabilize the soil so it mm. won't settle much and land subsidence will redu should reduce and. I just want to see it, um, yep. do we have some expertise we can use? And I'm a civil engineer, so yep. I'm sure this needs a fair bit of biological sort of expertise. The, the, the microbes that are being added to the soil will influence that, as will the plants that are growing in that, that soil as well. Um, that's something that is um, fairly straightforward to measure using a soil penetrometer. Um, so it's it's certainly something that we could incorporate. We will keep in touch. Yes. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Jeff. Um, any other questions from, from from others? Michael and Said. Sorry. Said and Michael raised their hands. Okay, oh, I can. Okay. Yeah, I could, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yes, sorry. Yeah, you are. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I can go ahead. Uh, my question is mainly or a comment towards uh, Jason and Dana's presentation and the group. 
I think their work is really uh, interesting and very complementary to the work that we are thinking as part of economic evaluation, because uh, my understanding is that uh, they would also do a lot of stakeholder consultation and understand their perception and um, from different end users. And there is lots of complementarity. And I think we need to be <laughs> more frequently in touch, I think, especially in these two groups. Yeah, it's, the, it's just a comment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And do you have a comment on that, Jason, as well? I would just say I, we have already been in um, communication with Carla, so and we intend to because the two, I, particularly um, Griffith's work and the two streams of Griffith's work is very important and par is parallel to our work. I think there's some differences, which is good. There's going to be some slight yeah. differences, which is great, but I think they need to, we need to work together and they need to be a little bit more complementary now that we know where we're going. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I will try to be more on board from now on, especially yeah. with this aspect. Thank you. That's great to know. That's great. Um, Michael, please. Uh, yeah, thanks. And, and it's sort of a follow on related question to Syed's question, just um, it was towards, you know, Dana and um, Jason's projects. I mean, I, I was, I, I just was thinking about your objective three around the perceptions and thinking also about the work we've done in the, you know, the water sector about recycled water and how, you know, things got politicized and, um, and I just sort of wonder with this hub that maybe seems it, it all sounds fantastic to us to consider human urine for fertilizer products, but uh, to get that message right early on to get the market perception uh, right early on to me is uh, it, just from the water industry side of you know experiences and, and it also works in other areas as well seems like a really important study so yeah it was just more of a comment but i don't know if you've got some thoughts on that already about that perception um yeah matter yeah <clears throat> yeah i well i certainly because i think one of the aims of our projects is there's there's certain gaps in the current knowledge um particularly about yellow water and that sort of thing um but i think that Part of our project is there's also a lot of other areas out there and a lot of other sources of knowledge in parallel, which have operated in parallel. So it's a it's a bit of a balance, particularly in similarly in circular economies. Um, we we're focusing on particular dimensions of circular economies here, but some of the other dimensions of circular economies might have those as stronger insights that can be played can relate to this project. And I think that's the sort of point you're getting at there is that sort of there's many different knowledges out there. They well, can be very different in terms of perception, but and we have to be very careful there. Well, so, yeah, and yeah. it's how things can be politicized, like, you know, the yuck factor with recycled water and Toowoomba, a whole yeah. project was like, you know, canned. Um, just because once things become great and that's a great outcome, but, you know, for, from this hub would be that it goes into a bigger scale um, and something just knocks it out, knocks it down because, you know, somebody wants to say that there's, for example, in the water is how do you know um, hospital waste is not in there or something like that. And, you know, it just creates a big issue that we have to deal with besides all of the greater benefits that uh, we, we we already know. So it's just yes. things like that, that um, um, come to mind, you know, just in getting that marketing right. And I think, you know, Perth has done it well. And obviously Singapore was a fantastic example for recycled water, but, yeah, it can go wrong if it's not done right in the early phases. <clears throat> I agree totally. And, in, and as if we don't actually talk to all the different stakeholders involved, um, in particular, the political, um, uh, there's been many a time a minister has shot down a project, mm. recycling project of many different types <laughs> with a sa single statement in the media. That's right. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, well, very important work. I, yeah, I look forward to it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Michael and Jason. Um, <clears throat> we have Stefano, um, please, Stefano. And also, I just want to say that we have um, colleagues or team members from Bernadette's team as well. So if you could also probably answer on behalf of Bernadette, just in case. Exactly what I'm after. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, my question is for Bernadette. So maybe Dio or other collaborator might address that or, or report to... Uh, I will try. Yeah, no, it's just a matter of uh, synergy. Um, in the, her video, Bernadette said that she would be ready to start in August and going through to summer. Uh, but our 
pilot plant in Brisbane is not going to be up and running until next year. So we will only be able to provide the urine derived fertilizer from the UGOL trials a little bit later. So, um, so how is that going to work? Uh, or is there other, other urine derived fertilizers that are available for trial? I think that because you mentioned urban utilities, there should be some synergy there. And I think we, the timing uh, would be critical. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you for that. The uh, work that we plan to start at the end of August is mainly around uh, work package uh, two, which is around the biosolids uh, derived fertilizers and biochar. Um, because that is in the glass house, it, if then we have materials from your work uh, to be tested in the glass house and the conditions will be exactly the same, um, then we can rerun the experiment later when we have the material from your work. Okay. All right, thanks, Stefano. And your Janice, um, uh, Sean, please. Yeah, just uh, my question goes to Jeff. So Jeff, you know, the people trying to develop smart fertilizer to reduce the loss of the nitrogen. And the, our urine fertilizer, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, carbon compound, which are different from the normal commercial fertilizer. So I'm just wondering that whether uh, you can try to develop like a smart fertilizer because based on the our own characteristics of the U gold and the over fertilizer, the mixture of the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, so many micronutrients. So whether some of the binder can be utilized and then you can just uh, spread this uh, urine fertilizer in your soil condition. So let them slowly releasing, slowly releasing, rather than just to, just to release the, on the uh, groundwater system and they quickly disappear and then discontaminate the environment. So whether you can think about some of the smart fertilizer from our oval and you called fertilizer system. Do you think it is possible? Um, I, I kind of look at smart as just a marketing ploy mm -hmm. for something that's slightly different from something that's conventional. Um, um, and so looking at it from that perspective, the fact that these fertilizers contain a lot of micronutrients, but also carbon um, can act, is an additional benefit. Um, so in some of those really uh, poor soils that we're working with, there's very little carbon in those. And the only carbon that um, is going into those soils is, some, is carbon associated with you know, bacteria that might be fixing carbon from the atmosphere or plants when we can get them to grow, um, plant roots that are adding carbon to that soil. Um, however, the conventional fertilizers don't have hardly any carbon in them. Um, that carbon that's in these urine derived fertilizers uh, can be a, a way to prime those microbes that are um, assimilating the nutrients, holding them within the soil uh, until the plants grow to the point that they can um, then take up and assimilate those nutrients uh, instead of them just being lost either through um, gas into the atmosphere or via leaching or via runoff. So I, th I think that's a, that's a selling point associated with these fertilizers that really sets them apart um, from the conventional products. All right, thanks. Thanks, thanks Jeff. Um, I'm very aware of the time. So I guess we have one more question from this It's still a very interesting discussion, but um, I'll just take probably one more question. Um, is that, are you raising your head or is that from uh, one? Yes, just a quick question. I think this question, All right. Uh, this question is to everyone, you know, um, um, please excuse if 
excuse my knowledge if I don't know much, but you know, I just wonder, is there much difference between the urine that human produces and what we get from the farms from cattle and so on? And uh, uh, are we focusing mainly here on the human urine or because I know we create a lot of urine in the farms as well. Can anyone by any chance answer this question? I, I don't know who might be the right person. Sean, yourself, maybe I'm not sure. Yes, uh, we are also, yeah, we are very much uh, open for the, uh, our nitrogen, phosphorus, our fertilizer source. So it doesn't have to be human urine source. It can be a pig or a cattle, even any other uh, industrial wastewater. So as long as we have uh, a lot of uh, rich nitrogen MPK water source, so we are very much interested because basically our technology is very much similar to recover this nutrient. So you can also expand your scope. If you have any good source of the like uh, pig wastewater, even cattle wastewater, any animal wastewater, they just utilized a lot of uh, uh, the extract, excrete, and then they can, we can recover their own nutrient using our technology. I see. So the technology kind of uh, we develop, it is kind of versatile, I guess, can be used for any type of urine. I see. All right. That's correct. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Also, yeah, if uh, Nana agree, just last question. So we have uh, uh, utilized so many different uh, terminology of the fertilizer. Some people, like Dana mentioned about renewable fertilizer. And then the, the Benedict, she's talking about biofertilizer. And some people are talking about urine derived fertilizer. And also I'm talking about the organic fertilizer or a nice fertilizer. So we are just mixed all the top like uh, renewable, renewable fertilizer, biofertilizer, nice fertilizer, organic fertilizer. I just, my question is which fertilizer we are producing? from human urine or animal wastewater or any uh, nutrient-rich wastewater source. How, how we can call this fertilizer? Do you have any good justification? Is it biofertilizer or organic fertilizer or renewable fertilizer or maybe urine-derived fertilizer? Hang on. That, 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 could, that could be a collective outcome of this program to define and standardize uh, terminology around fertilizers. That's correct. So we can utilize the consistent way of the fertilizer. So maybe that's the next, uh, our uh, question to the next summit. So we will answer what's the best way to represent the, our urine derived fertilizer or biofertilizer, renewable fertilizer. So we will discuss again. So if you have any good justification, please send the email so we can share the, our knowledge through email. That's the, what I propose. Now, yeah, Sean, you, you. Could make a, you could make a survey and everyone can vote or something. That's a good idea. We can send <laughs> the, another survey after yeah, this well, following yeah. up the, yeah, our well, call, first call. summit. Call for and suggestions always, and then a vote. Yeah. <laughs> I'd always I'd also suggest maybe there's a technically technical name which could be used by the people who are here, but there might be also a better name which actually the market yeah. wants. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> to right. hear. Yeah. So I was gonna say. Be, yeah. Yeah, I could ask my kids, for example, see what they say. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, definitely we will remove the word urine there if we want to market, probably. Mm. For the factor, so yeah, there's urine there. That's gonna be a issue for for the lay lay people. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we can have more discussion on that in the future. Um. All right. So I guess we end up our second session. Uh, thank you very much for all the speakers, including the speakers for the first session as well. Um, it has been a very uh, productive discussion, and I guess uh, we are at the end of this. Uh, summit. So I'll call on Sean for the parting words and some uh, final message, please. Yeah, thank you for the, your particip participation for this uh, first uh, nice uh, summit. 
So I'm very happy to get together and then know each other. So all the people, so also very happy to start our project finally during our very difficult time for this pandemic. And thank you everybody for the, your strong support as your CIs. Also, you are the person to bring the industry partner. Also, thank you very much for your strong support to deliver your project. And we just uh, know each other from this uh, summit. So you can send the email to everybody. You know that the, who is doing what kind of research, what kind of knowledge they have, what kind of collaboration you can uh, accelerate with the other collaborator. So this is the good timing you can now feel free to contact anybody in this group, in this CI or any PhD student, so you can have a collaboration. Also, uh, next uh, important item is the second AIC NICE Summit will be held in 17th of November. So we will invite the, some of the important people for the launching of the, this AIC NICE Hub. So if you, uh, want to propose anybody who want to talk in the launching in our project. So please let me know. Also, this is the in-person conference. Also, we can organize the second, the summit. So you can present based on the, your progress of the, your research project. Also, we can finalize your annex C. And then industry engagement is the most important for our project because uh, they will support more project, not only this existing cash contribution, but also we want to extend our scale up or some other opportunity because uh, you have a already minimum project. So based on the, this project for next couple of years, we can extend uh, some more cash contribution from industry partners. So please, uh, let us know if you need any support. Also, you just organize a meeting with the, your industry partner regularly, and then you will have a more trust to bring the more cash contribution in this project or some other research funding opportunity. So that's the what I can propose for this uh, uh, first summit. Thank you again all, and then looking forward to singing you in our second summit. So we will have a in-person uh, conference again in November. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.